Today we're going to be talking about lactic acidosis. But before we get into the topic, let me take you a couple of steps back to your undergrad life where you learned about, you know, boring stuff that didn't make any sense in life. And one of these were stereoisomers. And the definition of a stereoisomer are molecules that have the same composition but different orientation. And you can think about stereoisomer like your hands. Both of your hands have five fingers. But if you apply your right hand on top of your left hand, you notice that their orientation is slightly different in the sense that your thumbs are facing opposite directions. And this is kind of similar concept to what we see in stereoisomers. And one of the common stereoisomers that we have in our body is lactic acid. The stereoisomers of lactic acids that we have are L-lactic acid and D-lactic acid. And their difference is mainly located here. In the D-lactic acid, the CH3 group is located above the plane of the molecule and thus represented by the solid line. In the L-lactic acid, the CH3 group is located below the plane of the molecule and thus represented by the dashed line. Now to your eyes, this difference might seem small, but to your body and clinically, this is fairly significant difference. So stick around to learn about L-lactic acidosis and D-lactic acidosis and in which condition do we see each. So let's first talk about L-lactic acidosis. And the reason I started with L-lactic acidosis is because it's the more common one. It's the one that you see in everyday practice. And L-lactic acid stereoisomer is the stereoisomer that your body is able to produce and your body is able to metabolize easily. Now, L-lactic acidosis can be divided into two big categories. One is type A and the other one is type B. In order to understand the difference between the two, I wanna take you a step back to biochemistry where you learned about glycolysis. And glycolysis first starts with converting the glucose to pyruvate. Now, in the norm normal state of health where you have adequate perfusion and oxygenation to your end organs, pyruvate will be converted to acetyl-CoA and then acetyl-CoA will undergo sequence of reaction in curb cycle to form ATP. Now this sequence of reaction depicted by the red arrows needs oxygen to be driven. However, when your patient is septic, when your patient is in severe dehydration, the pyruvate needs to find alternative pathway that, that does not require oxygen. And that is the anaerobic glycolysis converting the pyruvate to lactic acid. So in those critically ill patients, you will have overproduction of lactic acid, and that's what we categorize as type A. Now, once you treat these patients, once you give them fluids, you give them antibiotic, you treat their critical illness, the lactic acid will then go to the liver and be metabolized there. And that's why when you treat those patients, the lactic acid will then eventually go down. And this is a good bridge to type B lactic acidosis where you have difficulty metabolizing the lactic acid. And not surprisingly, this is commonly seen in liver disease, which is the center of lactic acid metabolism. You see it in patients taking certain medications such as HIV drugs, such as metformin, or beta-2 agonists such as albuterol can cause that as well. We also see it in patients with certain malignancies such as leukemia and lymphomas as well. Now, L-lactic acidosis is easily de de detected through the ABG that you get every day or the routine labs that you get every day. Now, this is not the case with the other stereoisomer, which is D-lactic acid, which we're going to talk about next. <laughs> 
D-lactic acidosis, on the other hand, is a much more rare condition. It only occurs in those individuals with short bowel syndrome. And those patients had their majority of their small intestines resected in a prior surgery. In order to understand the pathogenesis of how D-lactic acidosis occurs, we have to observe closely what happens when these individuals ingest a heavy carb meal. In healthy individuals like you and I, when we eat a heavy carb meal, these complicated polysaccharides will reach to our stomachs and then from the stomach will reach to the small intestines. And in the small intestine, they will get broken down into simple monosaccharides by pancreatic amylase and other enzymes located in the small intestines. And once you break it down to simple monosaccharides, the monosaccharides will be absorbed into the bloodstream through the intestinal wall and then eventually will be utilized for energy. However, in patients with short bowel syndrome, when they ingest such a heavy carbs meal, these complicated polysaccharides will reach to the stomach and from the stomach, they will bypass the small intestines and reach to the colon in large amount. And this becomes a problem. The reason is, in the colon, you have these colonic bacteria that will utilize such a heavy undigested carb load in a fermentation reaction that will form D-lactic acid as a byproduct. And if you ingest the heavy carb load, that means you will have a large amount of this fermentation reaction and a large amount of D-lactic acid being formed. And eventually the D-lactic acid will be absorbed into the bloodstream and causes high anion gap metabolic acidosis. However, this high anion gap metabolic acidosis will have normal lactic acid. The reason is this lactic acid level that you measure on a routine lab will only detect the L-lactic acid stereoisomer, but not the D-lactic acid stereoisomer. So these individuals will have HAGMA, but with normal lactic acid levels. And in order to detect the level of D-lactic acid, it has to be a send out order to an outside facility that will take days. So a lot of physicians, they diagnose such a condition based on their clinical suspicion. And these individuals, they will present as, you know, having brain fog symptoms and bloating after a heavy carbs meal. And the way you treat such condition is by correcting the acidosis. You give, you give this, these individuals fluids, you give them bicarbs based on their pH level, and some studies shown that PO antibiotics can be effective. The theory behind that is the PO antibiotics will reach the colon and will reduce the amount of bacteria in the colon and thus reducing the amount of fermentation and the lactic acid formation. And the third thing is that you want to avoid anything that promote the lactate formation, such as LR or probiotics. And once these, once these patients get better, they get discharged, you have to remind them to maintain a low-carb diet to prevent such an incident from reoccurring. So the next time you have a patient with short bowel syndrome, keep D-lactic acidosis in mind, especially if they present with high anion gap metabolic acidosis and the normal lactic acid on routine labs. And now you know.